is she's an amazing woman. She's most one of the most outstanding women I've met. And I've met a lot of women over the years. And yet down to earth, I've had the privilege to know her. She has a most remarkable life. From an impoverished, homeless adolescent who left home, was on her own in high school, to enlisted member of the Maryland Guard, to graduating from officer candidate school, to leading operations between Western forces and Afghan military and police, to a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology, to the Major General of the Maryland National Guard, responsible for the daily operations of all the Maryland's military um, programs air and army national guard maryland emergency management agency and maryland defense fund she was in the um governor's cabinet overseeing all the military pieces as the first woman the first african-american woman to serve in this position during her illustrious career she has worked to enhance diversity and mentorship she continues to be an advocate for women's rights and for the elimination of childhood and military sexual abuse she unfortunately experienced it. Today, she serves as advisor to assist veterans, military families, and businesses in leadership and personal development. And on top of all this, she has, she has been appointed as the chair of the Maryland Commission on the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution. What a mouthful for this commission, but she has overseen the 100 year celebration here in Maryland. As she please, speaks, please, if you have questions, write them on chat. And when she, the general is finished speaking, I will um, then uh, read some of the questions so she can answer them. There's too many to try and do it on Zoom any other way. She's here. Good. General Singh, it's a pleasure to see you. You didn't hear my wonderful words about you, but we're looking forward to your talk on the history of suffrage in Maryland and know you bring a lot of wisdom with it and we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much and good morning everyone. So are we ready to for me to actually get started? Yes. Oh great. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully I don't have too much here for you all today. So um, you know we'll try to go through this as um, so let me share. Okay, uh, host. Okay, I can't share. So can someone hand over the screen to me? I, I made you co-host just now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, are we good? Can everyone see that? Yes. And can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect. And so um, good morning everyone and thank you Helen for um, really in inviting me to do this. And I've done a number of these, but this is the first one that I'm actually using this presentation for because I, I've uh, got a number of things later on this year and I wanted to be able to make sure that I had something that um, really reflected kind of really the journey that, has act, that actually took place leading up to um, the passage of the 19th Amendment. And you know, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States really barred women, um, it barred you know, states uh, from, ex barred from, ex barred states from excluding women, excuse me, from uh, the ballot solely based on their sex. It was signed into law on August 26, 1920, so we're coming up on the anniversary, and the passage of the amendment was the result of decades of work by thousands of women across the country, and really women and men, because it wasn't just women alone, that really were working towards change. Not everyone followed that same path in the fight, and not even not everyone really had a view of how we were going to accomplish this in the same direction. The key thing is that the 19th Amendment, it was, you know, it was a tough struggle and it went over many, many years. 
but it is also the story of what I would highlight as the cooperation and alliances and how they're formed and how movements happen, not only across the US, but globally. And I do apologize because I'm going to be turning some pages. So if you hear me, I, I do apologize. Um, the movement actually got its start in uh, the abolitionist circles during the mid 19th century when most married women lacked the basic property rights. Progressive minded women and men gathered at Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 based on the notion that it is the duty of women of this country to secure for themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. And during that time, that was pretty radical. However, the convention was organized by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Candy Stanton and Lucretia Mott. That marked the beginning of the formal women's suffrage movement. The men and women of the movement made speeches and petitioned Congress, pursuing government officials to recognize the women's right to vote. In 1848, Canton presented the Declaration of, uh, Declaration of Rights and Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention, which took place in upstate New York. The convention kicked off the women's right movement uh, several activists were presented, including the social reformer Lucretia Mott and Frederick Douglass. And as you can see, this is part of the signature and the role that they actually kept. But what I thought was important is, you know, the Declaration of Sec uh, Sentiments was really about why women were requesting the right to vote. And it really went through all of the different forms of you know, why we should be given the same right and equal right as men. And when you really go through and look at it, um, what kind of makes me think about this even today is that we still struggle with many pieces of what was put, put forth in the sentiments. And so as we look at um, these, I think we have to take this and say, well, what does it mean for us today? And what are we still fighting for? What, what do we still need to fight for? In 1848, Canton, um, I'm sorry, I actually hit that one. Um, it's Susan B. Anthony, however, did not attend um, the event at Seneca Falls. That didn't mean that she was not completely engaged and she was seen as a very important player in the, the uh, 19th Amendment to the point that it was even named after her. During uh, her overall lifetime, you would have to think of, you know, the role that she played. She was chased down by angry mobs at her speeches in favor of not only um, the women's suffrage, but also uh, abolitionism. She was arrested. Um, for voting. She had bottles thrown at her. And, you know, while she was speaking at public events, you know, her safety was uh, in jeopardy. And in times, she actually had to be escorted out of town by police guards. However, she did not live to see the 19th Amendment added to the Constitution. And so um, even though that finally happened 14 years after her death, she believed and proclaimed in her last public speech that failure is impossible. And to me, I just feel like um, she was such a visionary in being able to see what could actually happen. During her, um, really all of her time, she became friends with Elizabeth Candy Stanton as well as Lucretia Mott. And it was really, on the backs of these three women that we see a lot of the heavy lifting that started out during that time. And then we have Frederick Douglass, who was also one of the men who was present. And a lot of times we don't think about this, but he was there and he was a pioneer for women's rights during that convention in Seneca Falls. His support of women's rights never wavered, even though publicly he, doesn't, he didn't always agree with, Candy, uh, with Elizabeth Stanton and Susan B. Anthony for um, who he called um, for women's suffrage simultaneously 
or voting for blacks' rights. So there was really this kind of tough balance that he was trying to play and saying he's fighting for the rights of blacks, but yet he also has to fight for women's rights. And he was really getting caught kind of in this, this really um, tussle, as in which side should he stand? And nonetheless, even though he, he did have these disagreements, he remained a constant champion of the right of women to vote. In 1988, in a speech before the International Council of Women in Washington, D.C., he recalled his role at Seneca, at Seneca Falls Convention, although he insists that women rather than men should be the primary spokesperson for the movement. Many African-American women also pushed for the rights, beginning with Sojourner Truth, who in 1851 made her impassioned Ain't I a Woman speech other African-American women, such as Mary Ann uh, Shad Carey and uh, Charlotte Gimmick, Grimmick, uh, the niece of two abolitionist suffragettes, uh, Marietta and Harriet Fortin, participated in suffrage organizations. Unfortunately, as was the case in society, oftentimes American, African-American women weren't always welcomed by white suffragettes and had to participate in separate organizations. In 1896, many Black women, women's clubs uh, affiliated to form the National Association of Colored Women with Mary Church Terrell as the president. During the Civil War and through the years that led up to it, there, were, there was some strife as the suffragettes were told to put their crusades aside um, since enslaved individuals were worse off than privileged white women, Anthony reminded everyone that half of the slaves were also women. This sentiment was echoed by, the, by former slave and women's rights activist, Sojourner Truth. Anthony helped, Anthony, Susan B. Anthony helped fugitive slaves escaped and also helped anti-slavery rallies. Sojourner Truth and Stanton gathered signatures to pass the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, formally abolishing slavery. Then in 1870, the passage of the 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution caused additional rifts because it eliminated voting restrictions due to race or color, but not gender. The National Women's Party created their own flag to symbolize their struggles to achieve women's suffrage. During the rally, during the drive to ratify the 19th Amendment, um, they would sew a star on, onto a flag for each state that ratified the amendment. And these colors in this particular flag, so the purple and the gold and the white, are the colors that we still use today. They used the flag when they were picketing at the White House at the unheard times, um, you know, parades and demonstrations. And when the 19th Amendment was finally ratified, the leader of the parley, party, Alice Hall, unfurled the flag with stars representing all of the states at their national headquarters. The still day spells prison for about 16 of the suffragettes who picketed at the White House. Um, Miss Julia Herbo of uh, Morristown, New Jersey, led 16 members of the National Women's Party who participated in the picketing in front of the White House in, uh, in, uh, on July 14, 1917, which actually led to their arrest. These 16 women were sent to the workhouse at Occoquan on July 17th upon their refusal to pay fines of $25 each, but were pardoned on July 19th. And I think some of you have visited some of these facilities. Turning our attention to the Maryland history, in the 20th century, there were at least three major women's uh, suffrage organizations that were active in Maryland. The Maryland State Suffrage Association, the Just Government League of Maryland, and the Equal Suffrage League of all organized events and held meetings throughout the state. 
um, for the right to vote. So this was going on, even though Maryland was not one of the states to ratify. And members of the state organizations also joined the National American Women's Suffrage Association and sent delegates to the conventions around the country. In 1906, the National Association uh, Women's Suffrage Association held its annual convention in the, um, at the Baltimore Lyric, um, where Susan B. Anthony delivered her final speech three months before she died. So while this is not a picture of um, the Lyric, this is a picture of the convention that was being held where they also presented at the 5th Regiment Armory. So for me, I actually wanted to show this one versus the lyric that's not far from the 5th Regiment Armory. This era gave way to a new strategy and new voices. Edith Houghton Hooker became convinced that the progressive reform would occur quickly and completely if women achieved the right to vote. She then returned to Maryland and founded the League of Women Voters of Maryland. She served as the president of the League of Women Voters, Voters of Maryland for 20 years, longer than anyone since. She also believed that every woman should have the knowledge of our courts and institutions. She would sit in the court when young delinquents were arraigned to give moral support to the frightening girls and to monitor the character of the interrogation. It was often unfavorable treatment of these young women that led her to work on the creation of the juvenile court and for the state supervised schools for girls requiring supervision. Maryland's suffrage movement was experiencing a renaissance in 1909. Hooker organized the Just Government League and affiliated her organization with the National American Women's Suffrage Association. In 1910, the defeat of the suffrage in the Maryland General Assembly led Hooker and others to believe that while they should continue to press the state legislature for suffrage legislation, the answer lay in the passage of the National Constitutional Amendment. The creation of the 1912 Maryland Suffrage News by, by Hooker as the official origin of the Just League, uh, as the Just League government, uh, Just Government League addressed each of those needs, unity, a statewide presence and public information. The news became the weekly voice, not just, not for the Just Government League, but for the suffrage movement in Maryland, since the general circulation of newspapers paid, paid little attention to the suffrage. The news included information such as the latest count of pro-suffrage states, techniques for countering anti-suffrage arguments, and helping women feel connected with like-minded women throughout the state. In addition, it informed its subscribers, most of whom were middle class, of the needs and circumstances of the working class women and the problems associated with education, crime, and corruption, and the negative aspects of industrialization. In 1917, Hooker was asked to serve as the editor of the Suffragette, the official publication of the National Women's Party. The American women's suffrage movement is usually characterized as predominantly white, pro, uh, Protestant, Anglo-Saxon, and upper and middle class in composition and support. Although this may be true as far as the formal organizations are concerned, the issues of women's suffrage was supported and often, often actively by large um, segments of immigrants and working class. On January 21st, 1913, the BHC gave women full suffrage and elected the first women to the BHC board. Also on that day, 150 delegates representing 52 congressional women's groups meant in Cincinnati, Ohio, to organize the National Federation of Temple Sistershoods. The Jewish community played a crucial role in the suffrage victory in New York State in 1917, but their movements of support started way before. New York occupied 
a strategic position in the struggle for women's suffrage. Most early suffrage victories had taken place in the Western rural and rural states and suffragettes were convinced that farmers and Native Americans were their main support rather than their urban working classes. New York was seen as the first Eastern industrial state to give women the vote prior to the constitutional amendment in 1920. And a victory in New York was considered crucial for convincing Congress to act on the federal amendment. Suffragettes also believe that New York City presented almost insurmountable problems. In 1910, approximately 37% of the population was Roman, Roman Catholic and 31% Jewish. 13% were either first or second generation Irish and a similar number of first or second generation Italian. By 1920, at least 78% of Manhattan was either foreign born or had had foreign born parents. New York conducted two referenda, referendas on suffrage in 1915 and 1917. In the early vote, the issue was defeated by a narrow margin in both New York City and the state. And in 1917, however, the amendment passed in both the city and the state as a whole, although losing the state outside New York City. It was the city with the largest Catholic Jewish immigrant and working class population, which carried the state of women's suffrage. Although the early equal rights society was integrated by the 20th century, white suffragettes in Maryland usually excluded African American women from participation. As in many parts of the country, black women in Maryland formed organizations that worked for civil and social uplift for the community including women's right to vote, Augusta, including women's right to vote. Augusta Chisel formed the Progressive Women's Suffrage Club in 1915 to work for the enfranchisement of all women in the state. After the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, she wrote a column for the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper called A Primer for Women Voters to help guide and educate women in their new civic role. Despite their work, Maryland suffragettes were unsuccessful in winning the vote statewide. Several measures over the past years to enfranchise women were voted down in the Maryland legislature. A few Maryland towns offered extremely limited support to women. In Annapolis, women voted in, in bond elections beginning in 1900 but could not vote for any elected officials. The towns of Still Pond in Kent County allowed women taxpayers to vote in municipal elections in 1908. Although the town charter adopted in, uh, in Link, Lincoln Heights and Garrett County should have granted women to vote in local election, elections, it doesn't appear that women were ever permitted to participate. The Still Pond History, Historic District, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, includes the former site of the town hall. It was here that the women of, the Maryland, of Maryland cast their first ballots 12 years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Residents such as Anna Baker Maxwell, Jane Clark Howard, and Lily Derringer Kelly voted in the local election. That year, the town recognized the suffrage rights of women over the age of 21. 14 women were registered, including two African Americans. The town later repealed this rule and women were once again left without a vote until 1920. On March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson's presidential election, thousands of women marched along Pennsylvania Avenue the same route that the inaugural parade would, parade would take place the next day in a procession organized by the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Designed to illustrate women's exclusion from the democratic process, the procession was carefully choreographed by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, the newly appointed chairs of the Congressional Committee. The committee was tasked with winning the passage 
of the Susan B. Anthony Amendment to the United States Constitution, which was first proposed in 1878. Women marched in delegations from their states or with others from their professions or in their academic regalia from universities they attended. It demonstrated that women's participation in the public sphere was dignified and in keeping with America's moral values. The marchers found themselves trapped in a sea of hostile, jeering men who yelled vile insults and sexual propositions to them. They were manhandled and spat upon. The women that were received, that, uh, the women that they received no assistance from nearby police who looked on bemusedly and admonished the women that they wouldn't be in this predicament if they had stayed at home. Although few women fled the terrifying scene, most were determined to continue. They locked arms and faced, to ambush, and faced the ambush, some through tears. While they could ignore their taunts, some banished uh, banners, uh, banner poles and flags and hat pins to ward off the attackers. They held their ground until the US troops arrived about an hour later to clear the streets so that the procession could actually continue. The coverage of the march was often more prominent on the front page news than Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. The parade was important not only because of its size, but also because of the participants challenged traditional ideas of how women should behave in public. They were loud, bold, and theatrical. Those who opposed women's suffrage feared that society would suffer if women played a role besides wife and mother. Such opposition would eventually be overruled in 1919, both the House of Representatives and the Senate passed the 19th Amendment. The amendment then went to the states for ratification. 36 states needed to ratify the amendment in order for it to be adopted. And Harry Byrne in Tennessee, House of Representatives cast the decisive vote. Byrne had planned to vote against the amendment, but changed his mind after his mother urged him to be a good boy and vote for the ratification. On, the 18th, on August 18, 1920, the 19th Amendment went into effect. On November 2nd of that year, over 8 million women voted in the U.S. election for the first time. Women also ran for political office in great numbers. Jeanette Rankin was one of the few women to hold office before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. When she was elected to Congress in 1916, she made a prediction that would soon come to pass. I may be the first woman member of Congress, but I won't be the last. After the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, suffragettes like Alice Paul knew their work was not finished. While the government recognized women's right to vote, many women still faced discrimination. Paul and other members of the National Women's Party drafted the Equal Rights Amendment. amendment. If ratified, the amendment would guarantee equal rights of, to all people regardless of their gender. The Equal Rights Amendment was ratified by both, con both houses of Congress in 1970s but failed to get adequate support from the states. It has not been, rat it has not yet ratified to the constitution. Women's rights advocates did not make uh, progress in passing other legislation until after 1920. Congress passed the Equal Rights Pay Act in 1963, making it illegal to pay women less uh, for doing the same job as men. A, la a year later, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This act often associated with the civil rights movement as it prohibits employers from discriminating against an individual based on their race. The act also states that employers cannot discriminate against someone based on their gender. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, employers could choose not to hire women based on their gender. And with that, we are at the 100th year anniversary of the women's right to vote. And it is so extremely important that we realize that while much work has been done, we still have so much to do. And with that, ladies, I will open it up for questions. 
Hi. Wonderful. It gives us a great background. And um, I'm curious, since Marilyn, it was in March of 41, <laughs> that Marilyn finally passed it. Are we going to celebrate that as well? It'll be 80 years. So we are celebrating. And so that's a, a great, um, a kind of a great lead in. And because of COVID, right? So another, and it's only fitting that we're at this 100th year anniversary. And we are among these times that's just pretty crazy and tumultuous, right? So we're seeing probably some things that many of us have never seen in our history in terms of what's going on in the world right now. And so one of the big celebrations that's coming up here in August, it'll be a virtual celebration Good. of the 19th Amendment where the 19th Amendment Commission has partnered with the Maryland Women's Commission on the 26th to hold a virtual event. And I hope all of you um, we'll really um, take some time out to join that event. I think it's going to be amazing. Yeah, I, I will email it. I've already signed up, but we, we will email it around so people can register. Great. Are we going to do anything in March of, 40, of 21 to do 80 years for Maryland, or is it just a redundant to even think about it? Well, you know, so I will have to put that one forth and see if I can get maybe Secretary Scholl, since the governor... Um, earlier in the year and really towards the latter part of last year um, worked with um, Secretary Scholz and the Department of Commerce making this year as the year of the woman. And so we're highlighting and focusing women businesses and women entrepreneurs. Um, you'll also see for the Women's Commission, we're kind of doing this parade of sheroes where, you know, women that have just been amazing through this challenging time. And so what I'll have to do is I'll send that up to the governor's office and ask them if they're going to do something. I think the concern is going to be is we will still be in this kind of period of virtualness, right? And so maybe we can get them to do a virtual celebration or to sign another proclamation or some other event. Uh, um we know you've been fighting for women's rights <laughs> and your own rights <laughs> since in high school and all the way through. What's missing that we still need to fight for now? Well, I, I think, you know, right now the discussions that we're having, and if you look at a lot of the things even that I just went over, I mean, I was, you know, when I start going through and I doing, doing research on this and I really look at it, you know, women have been serving on boards and, you know, they've been leading organizations, they've been leading companies, but we're still not where we need to be in terms of equal pay. We're still not where we need to be in terms of equality overall, right? And so I think we have to to figure out, I mean, women have always been the key behind some of these major movements. And I think it's going to take women being able to engage and leverage the movements to take us out of where we are. And so I think that we still have a lot of work ahead of us to kind of set what's going to be that next path for the next hundred years. What do we want that impact to be? And if we want it to be equality, then what does that look like? You know, how are we going to take that forward? And I'm not real sure that we're all um, focused um, as much as we should be on this, I'm starting to see more people rallying around it and having the difficult conversations where we still realize we've made a lot of progress, but there's still much to be done. So where would you suggest we put our efforts as a women's group? Yeah, as a women's group, I think that your efforts need to be in having conversations with CEOs Right? And I say with CEOs because they can impact the workforce. We need to have conversations with them so that they understand what still are the, you know, what still the challenges are for our women in the workplace. And you know, my concern coming out of COVID is if you look at the scenario that we have right now, our schools are not going to open. Um, so therefore, we're going to be essentially homeschooling. Who is going to stay home with their kids and do the homeschooling? How many women are going to be having to make that decision because they need to take care of their kids? Someone has to be home. Or maybe, you know, they could afford to bring in someone that could actually tutor their kids and help out, but they have elderly parents living at home. So therefore, they can't have someone in their home. So how many women 
and how many minorities that can't afford to do what maybe some of the privileged can do are going to have to step away from their careers. And I would have to say that I think this is going to be a little bit more prevalent and I think it's not going to discriminate, meaning it's going to be men and women that may have to step away from their careers and it's going to have a longer term impact. And I'm not real sure that we focused in on that impact. So what I would say to your organization is starting to have those conversations. Okay, any other questions? Um, how, how can we help some of these families? We're all isolated. Um, you know, what can we do to help? You know, we can give computers, but then they don't have Wi-Fi. And then, you know, there's, there's lots of issues yes. that go beyond. Right, well, so first off, um, it is challenging to be able to help in the environment that we're in, but the very first thing that we can do is ensure that we have responded to the census, because the census is one of the places that starts with how the funds flow in to the various states and where, you know, and if we're not filling out the census and getting people to do that, then we are missing an opportunity to ensure that we're going to get our fair share. The second piece is that we have to get people to vote. Right, we really need to get people to vote. And, it, and you can see just how important it was through this movement that it's not just voting, it's making sure that your voice is heard by the legislators that are going to represent us. And you know what I'm starting to tell people is that if you don't like the, the legislators that are representing you, right, the congressional arm, then you need to get off your bum and actually start running for yourself, right? Like you have to do something about it. We can't sit back and just complain like we have to be engaged and be active wow that's a big <laughs> big shoe or foot or feet or whatever <laughs> to follow um and 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 our sisterhood and women of reform judaism have been on the cusp before so now it's our opportunity to look at the next phases and the steps um wrj has definitely one of the, our biggest roles has been pay equity yes in our congregations to start yes. with and then to move out. Um, anything else that you want to say at this point? And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I learned just through some of the research, right? So this, the whole, um, really the movement that happened out of New York, right? We find ourselves now here um, debating whether or not our immigration, you know, like, do we need to reform our immigration laws, right? Should we be looking at something different? What we are forgetting and what this really reminded me of as I was kind of going through this and putting this together and I wanted to make sure that I got it in there was what critical role that immigrants played in us being able to get any of those rights. And we forget that. And so I think helping to educate people on the importance and what immigration has actually done, because I don't know that we would be a free anything. I don't think that women would have the right to vote. I don't think that um, you know minorities would be seen as equal if we didn't have immigrations that joined that fight. And that to me was, it stood out so poignant, poignantly that um, I think we lose that in today's discussion. And so you, know, you all could really help to ensure that that story is told um, because it doesn't get told. Um, we miss it and people skate over it, right? It's not in the history books. I mean, I had to search deep and long and hard to be able to pull some of this out. Um, interesting, our congregation has a whole program and we're doing things in immigration. And one of our uh, watchwords of, of Jewish faith is you were strangers in the land yourself. So um, from that standpoint, a couple of comments have um, come out. A uh, couple people said we need to be sure more women are in the legislature or elected people. Um, we need to find ways to do child care that can be helpful at this time. And um, how can we influence the support of child care starting on the first year of the child's life was one of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, We've been fighting that for as long as I can remember, because if, if you can't have childcare, women can't go out of the house. So right. 
Uh, absolutely. And that continues to be, it's not just childcare, it's like affordable childcare and safe childcare. And so I would say that, you know, at some point here, we're probably going to have to start the movement of, you know, how do we, how do we um, set up these networks and organizations and, and to really validate people that help to keep our children safe. Um, and it's not just helping to keep them safe. You know, what I, you know, in, and, you know, granted my, my children are grown, um, but I have tons of kids in the family where, you know, one of the key things that I really focus in on and when I start talking to them about where their kids are going to be for childcare and, you know, one, not only is the home safe, but more importantly, what are they teaching? What are the morals and the ethics that this place is going to help to instill in your children? Because what we have to remember is we leave them with a childcare provider, and if they do not have the best ethics and morals, then our children are going to learn something from outside that may not necessarily be in conjunction. And so I, I think childcare is a huge one. Um, and me, you know, having had been a, a single parent and not necessarily being able to have the right childcare all the time for my, my oldest daughter, know exactly what it means to struggle you know, how do I work? And then how do I also get childcare and where my whole paycheck is going to pay for the childcare? And somebody asked, are there particular organizations for childcare that we should work with um, locally? You know, well. Well, there's the National Association of Edu National Education and then there's one for young people. I forget the name of it, but I don't know if they have local chapters or not. Yeah, I would have to look and see if they have local okay. chapters. I'm not really sure. We would too. And yeah. this this was on a totally different um, question, but they someone wanted to know if the U.S. military is continuing continuing to sp expand women's roles and leadership, and how is that affecting the whole uh, armed services? Well, and so that's an interesting question, right? Because with everything that has recently happened, it's brought more focus back into women's roles. And so one of the things, and I will kind of say this to you all, one of the things that I've seen in my last few years as adjutant general and serving is that we were opening up all these different roles to women. Um, the challenge is that at the senior levels, it was still going to take a little bit of time to get the right women with the right skills to compete for some of these roles where women just weren't able to compete. So we, we are seeing that happen. Um, but then we've also seen a lot of women who were on the forefront of fighting that, like myself and a number of others, have already retired, right? So, so we've kind of left a void. Um, but the, um, the Secretary of Defense has actually come out and said that he is asking for all the services to look at racism across um, our uh, armed services, realizing that um, it is not absent right? It is there. And we have to stop pretending that it's not there. And so it's not just racism. Uh, we recently had a young lady who was uh, raped and uh, dismembered by a guy and a, oh my and a girl, God. which is like really weird on, on an installation, right? And so, and so we are seeing that um, it's, it may not be as visible as it is in the public domain, because we have ways in which we can try to control it, but it still exists. Um, you know, really within the last couple of months, someone took, you know, my logo that I used for the five years that I was the adjutant general and posted it on a flyer in the 5th Regiment Armory and basically, you know, really put some language to it that said, and if you didn't know anything about the logo, then if you just read it, it was really more racially. Um, kind of, I guess it would have more racial undertones, but when you knew about the logo, it was like, if you felt like you were left out of history, then maybe you should go out and do something about it. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a longer paragraph. And I just basically, you know, did not agree with the way that it was being handled and decided I was going to go ahead and take the interview, which I typically wouldn't do. And I basically said they need to investigate. And if they're not going to investigate, then leadership needs to step down because therefore you are then emboldening this behavior. And so those are the things that, you know, in the military, we have to um, be bold enough to stand against those things when we know it exists within our ranks. And we can't just say, oh, well, you know, no, it doesn't really exist. We've, we've got to be able to deal with it ourselves. And that has got
to happen from within. Okay, two more things. One, and I think I can answer it, Maryland has ratified the ERA, correct? Yes. yes. Um, and somebody asked, not only are there issues with women in the armed forces, but what's the issues of anti-Semitism in the military? I mean, it's still, I mean, obviously it's, it's there. I mean, I'm not gonna say that the military is a perfect organization because it is a microcosm of our society. And so if you can imagine that we are recruiting from society, then we bring all of that into, and, in, and it really permeates through people's values while we try to instill a set of values that sees everybody equally. Um, you know, at times where there are idle minds, these things start coming out. And, and, and it happens even when they're not in this idle state, right? So we will all go and fight together, but not necessarily are we all considered to be equal when it comes to, um, you know, things at the end of the day. Great. I think we could continue asking you questions and figuring out where to go forever. 